Um, thank you for the introduction. So, yeah, uh, when asked to stop by and give a talk here, um, container storage is basically what, you know, anything you want about container storage. Yeah, so I thought, okay, well, I got into this talk, or this discussion with some people at uh, Container Days in Boston about container storage. And the thing I thought we kind of focused it a lot was talking about SA. Now, why SA? In fact, that's my. And this talk, by the way, is all about questions. And in the sense that I love questions, we'll get to them afterwards, I understand, but I'm also kind of phrasing it as a whole bunch of questions that kind of naturally fall out of each other. And so why pick on FSync? And actually, uh, Kai gave me a great you know, lead-in, which is, and it has to, yeah. You know, the important thing is that it's persisting something to disk, is what you said when you're saving the file or doing something, it's actually having to save it somewhere. That's why I'm picking on FSync. And I mean, if we think about it in terms of like a really functional programming in Haskell, right? It's straight up, give me a file descriptor and then do something. Do some IO, I don't know exactly what it's doing. This is also gonna be a very short talk, just in case you're worried and you wanna keep it very <laughs> um, And so in some sense, the pure function, and again, can I you know, introduce this, is, is your 12-factor app. It's a pure function, it doesn't really have much state to it, right? And the thing we care about is that something that works with actual, you know, that we actually care about is in this you know, sort of IO monadic world that actually exists. These are our actual programs, these are our databases that we want to run containers, which I do agree on. Um, so, you know, where did, so I wanted to think about, you know, what's a little cool demo to do? Where did we come from on this? Like, what's the his, like, a little bit of history behind FSync or, you know, disks in general, right? And so it turns out 4.2 BSD is where they first introduced the FSync command. Uh, before that, it was just sync. You had to do all disks, all the data, all at once. Um, and I thought, well, like, can I really dig into this? The answer is I kind of can. Because if I'm directly SSH in here, and I am, I'm going to boot up a VAX 780 and boot. <laughs> do a little retro computing around the stage and boot a machine running 4.3 BSD. Uh, just the way it was in 1986. In fact, September 15th, 1986. <laughs> um, sure enough, like in this room, not have a problem with it. And what's curious is it's actually a lot you know, more familiar than you think, um, even though it's a little bit slow. But what I really wanted to dig into was, hey, sure enough, it came with the source code. And if I remember where it is offhand, uh, yeah, here it is. You can use a very old version of VI that doesn't work with my term cap because it's so old. Um, and if we look for syscalls, uh, <laughs> yep, oh, oh yeah, that's my term cap. <laughs> hey, yeah, I can only get one line at a time. Sure enough, here it is. I think I can go slash uh, fsync though. And sure enough, here's the function definition. Instead of reading it that way, I've simplified this a little bit, and here we have it in modern VI and I've extracted the file. <laughs> but I just want to show it can be done. But what's really curious is it's you know, very simple. Call, call a lock, sync it, unlock it. That's going to become you know, important in a second. And what does that sync actually do? Which, well, that's... Uh, here's sync ID, the definition of. Um, and what I thought was really funny was the way they implemented it. And you can look here. And really, it's like, while the you know, block device is not busy, sleep. That's it. Keep going. And that's the, so at some point, <laughs> you have to you just kind of trust. You have to th think about how these things are actually getting to read this, right? So what it's doing when it's sleeping, right? This is where you're writing the slides. Is you know, it's talking to one of these things. And it's actually just literally writing them out things and hoping that the firmware does what it says it does. Hoping it meets the contracts and praying. So, okay, this is like F sync and wow, that's really kind of scary when you think about it, right? We're trying to persist our data to disk and who knows, right? <laughs> um, so what do we have today, right? What is it that, okay, you know, I just switched over to a modern Unix. I'm talking uh, on an XT4 file system. What does we have today? Well, it turns out it's not perfect, right? Because it depends on the hardware, same thing. So, uh, I always have. It's still arbitrarily costly. You know, an F sync could take forever, possibly. And it's in kernel mode, and you can't do anything about it. What I thought was interesting is there's a nice uh, write up in the ACMQ last, uh, in July. And I just got to read this quote because it's perfect. Implementing consistency directly atop the file system interface is like cleaning and sanity in court. You do it only if you have no other choice. When possible, a wiser strategy is to use a library such as SQLite that implements quash consistency below your application. 
but just kind of true. And so this also ties a little bit into the 12 factor app thing, which is that you know, we should really be talking to some other service which provides this for us. But okay, so what is this consistency and, what, and how do we drive this into the distributed world? And this is where you know, etcd and a bunch of things that CoreOS is working on come into play. Because if you guys read after his blogs, you know, the Call Me Maybe series, this is, I think, his number one most important graphic that you know, he referred to a number of times. The reason being is because what we call you know, consistency, or what we call asphalt, or what we call you know, safely written in some sense, meaningful sense, depends on, you know, in a distributed sense, where it comes from and what kind of uh, bounds it has on whether I can read the right after I write it, whether it's you know, writing at the same time, whether it could overwrite, whether the last write wins. Strong serializable just is there's a strict ordering. I can always guarantee that something is, you know, has written, and if so, when, and it kind of goes down from there into various other, you know, trickier. These are all very, you know, considered very strong. These are, and then these are just kind of like not at all. You know, they're just kind of local. These are, in fact, not unlike Docker containers that have no storage story that just kind of disappear in your 12 hundred hours story. Um, so yeah, why not just use a database? Yeah, we have these things, distributed databases, right? Do we really need a file system? And the answer, in my opinion, so this is where I start to get into questions, right? It's just sort of opinions and thoughts, which is maybe, right? If we wrote our apps correctly, if we did everything right, you know, we could just say, here, talk to this database, right? No problem, distributed system, you know, Cassandra, something reasonable, not Mongo. And, <laughs> but the problem is, you know, we have all these legacy apps that we want to talk about containers. We have all this work we've done in the past that we want to talk about bringing into this sort of new gray of new container world. And so, and it's also not using libraries, we just suggested from the ACM cube which was, you know, there are differences between services, right? We could, we'd like to abstract that as much as we can. We'd like to be able to say, here's this thing, we don't care how it's going, it just, it's gonna save a file. And we know that that f-sync is going to return, right? It just comes back to our thing. Um, if your database handles distributed world well, uh, that is also a thing, like, so, if, we're all, if we are ourselves, our database, right? How are we gonna store these things? If we ourselves are writing a container, a database in a container, you know, it has to have a file system abstraction of its own, otherwise it, it's calling fsync, right? So you can't you can pass it you can pass it down the line that, oh I can talk to some service, but that service also has to deal with it in and of itself. And it's hard to do correctly, right? In order to get that strong serializability, or at least good serializability, or at least good consistency story, you have to do a lot of work and you have to make sure that like the thing that kills NCD, just a side note is fsync actually and that's why i picked it uh it's because <laughs> because if you want to talk about what makes it slow or what makes the you know write slow is because every time you have to write the wall you have to save it to disk and make sure it actually hits disk somehow before i can say safely yes i've written it i could go away right now and i'd still be able to recover at least to that point which is you know what ncd is all about so actually one cool demo that was at uh, core os fest was Intel having some specialized hardware, which is basically this little battery-backed bit of memory that knew how to sync itself to disk. And so if your machine actually didn't crash, it would do its darndest to just save that to file a disk. And actually by using that instead of a real F-sync or an F-sync pass-through sort of thing, uh, they increased that CD performance by some order of magnitude. And it was really cool, but required special Intel proprietary hardware. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was really cool, but fair. I hope everybody gets that eventually. Um, and the other thing is like trade-offs when you talk about distributed systems for types of queries you want to run. Distributed joins are hard. I, I write databases, graph databases. I do it the slow and crappy way right now. And if there are better ways, if there's better sharding, if there's better things we can do, that's a whole other database problem, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. Um, and then aren't there already distributed file systems? Like, yeah, there's lots. There's Buster, there's Ceph, there's, oh man, uh, uh, HDFS. Uh, each of these has their own focus, block storage devices, blob storage devices, like, kind of like S3. Uh, each has their own metadata storage, which I always thought was kind of weird. Um, for instance, uh, Hadoop or HDFS had only one name node for a long time. I think that's better now. I think you can use Coop, uh, Zookeeper to d d designate a failover. But for a long time, it was a single point of failure. And what else? There's, you know, Gluster has its own monitors and metadata servers. Stuff does too. Uh, everybody does pretty much, and so everybody is sort of re-implementing the same sort of thing, 
this consistency story, and doing it kind of like we know it's hard. I mean, we know it's hard. We do it in that city, and it's one of these things which is always tricky. And each of them has their own performance things they're trying to go for. Like, oh, we deal with big files really well, or we deal with MapReduce really well, or we deal with you know a bunch of small files we can serve over HTTP really well. So that's always kind of a weird trick. So then I kind of want to finish. Well, okay, what's the dream? Given that this is kind of our whole background, what is it we'd like to have? And uh, you, know, you probably saw this in you know, college, you know, which is you, know, you have your CPU and your computation in general, and you have all your levels of caches right down to mass storage. And really, what you kind of want is just a distributed file system or something that looks like a file system to live here, right? Even mass storage is split over the time. So now we have SSD like drives that are sitting in front of large terabyte drives. Yeah, and, this tree could go on forever, but really this is kind of the, like, let's just have all the disks in the cluster working together, syncing together. This is you know, sort of GFS or Velocis writ large, right? Which is, how do we just say, all these disks are one big pool with replication. We don't really care what the data lives. We just know it's there. We know we've F-synced it, <laughs> air quotes intended, to the cluster image. And so things that would be nice in a container world, right? What sort of things would you want in a VFS in this containerized world? Well, you want you know, like a single container to deploy. So I know that I go to my Mesos or I go to my Kubernetes. I say, run one of these on everything. Mount its you know, folder with the right storing all its data and then just kind of go for it. <coughs> this is kind of uh, counter a little bit, or at least a different approach than Flocker was just done saying, just instead of tying one you know, disk sort of or mount, bind mount to a container, just say, it's all there. You can always get to it, no matter what. Uh, metadata and consensus. We already have a bunch of great consensus stories. That's a DE console. Zookeeper, if you want to set that up. And so now let that be your metadata server. Store your key values in that, which also means that the app can then use superpowers like, oh, I know where this data happens to live. I can ask the metadata server this as a library. Because it, it's just staying there in a key value store, you can actually reach out. And have a bit more smart about, smarts about where and how these things work. Uh, scheduling opportunities is very related to that, which is Kubernetes could then say, hey, where is that you know, disk living right now? I'm going to schedule it over there if I can, because that's got a copy of the replica. So that would be really nice, right? Because then you, instead of waiting 30 seconds for it to copy over, reattach the EBS drive or whatever it's doing, it could just say, oh, there's already a copy there. Hm, you're going there now. Um, and then pr provide POSIX, provide this whole file system semantic for legacy containers. And the S3 has options and other things. So instead of trying, to, but really, if once you have this, you can sort of do this. It's just a, another HTTP sort of. So really kind of trying to build that sync again, but this time in district. That's the last time I talked. So yeah. <laughs> I knew it was going to be quick.